Thus far, we have looked at the first seven ecumenical councils of the Church. Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon, 2nd Constantinople, 3rd Constantinople, and 2nd Nicaea. These first seven ecumenical councils are known as the Christological councils, since their theological content and the debates that occasioned them largely revolved around the Church's belief in the incarnation of the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. But these first seven were by no means the only ecumenical councils of the Church. In fact, the Catholic Church now recognizes 21 ecumenical councils throughout history. After Second Nicaea, the final Christological Council, there was the Fourth Council of Constantinople, the First, Second, Third, and Fourth Lateran Councils, the First and Second Council of Lyon, Vienna, Constans, Florence, the Fifth Lateran Council, the Great Council of Trent, and finally the First and Second Vatican Councils. Moreover, in addition to these 21 ecumenical councils, there were multiple, multiple more local councils throughout history, many of which played roles equally as important as some of the councils labeled ecumenical. So this leaves open the question, what makes a council ecumenical? Well, we must first realize that the definition of an ecumenical council has varied throughout history, and indeed, some councils were recognized as ecumenical only years after their assembly. Today, the Church recognizes an ecumenical council as an assembly of bishops convoked and presided over by the Pope for the purpose of formulating decisions concerning Christian faith and discipline, decisions which require papal confirmation. Through the ecumenical council, the ordinary magisterium of the Church that is, the Pope and all the bishops of the world united to him, convenes, deliberates, and through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, guides the Church towards a fuller understanding of and practice of the revealed Christian faith. The Code of Canon Law states, The College of Bishops exercises power over the universal Church in a solemn manner in an ecumenical council. And it also states, it is for the Roman pontiff alone to convoke an ecumenical council, preside over it, personally or through others, transfer, suspend, or dissolve a council, and to approve its decrees. Now, this final point, that it is for the Roman pontiff alone to convoke and preside over a council, is one that, more than any other, reveals how the nature of the ecumenical council has changed throughout history. For example, the first seven councils were not called by the Roman Pope at all, but instead were called by the Emperor. And although always playing an important role, the Roman Pope was not even present for many of these first important meetings. We must understand that the role that the Ecumenical Council has played in the life of the Church has also varied throughout time. For example, after the Second Council of Nicaea in the 8th century and up to the Great Council of Trent in the 16th century, there was an ecumenical council held roughly every 60 years. That's quite frequent. Now, after the Council of Trent, however, there was no ecumenical council for over 300 years. That is, until the First Vatican Council called in 1870, a council never formally closed until the opening of the Second Vatican Council roughly a century later. Now, this varied frequency testifies to the ever-changing understanding of the Council's role. On the one hand, the relative frequency of Councils throughout the Middle Ages shows how, at that time, the Council became the ordinary means by which the shepherds guided the Christian flock. This frequency led to the excess known as conciliarism, an error that amplified the authority of a Council over and above that of the successor of Peter, the Prince of the Apostles. On the other hand, the relative infrequency of councils post-Renaissance led to the alternative excess known as Ultramontanism, an error that amplified the authority given to the successor of St. Peter. 
Now, in reaction to conciliarism, the popes from the Renaissance and later were reluctant to resort to the ecumenical council as a means of guiding the church, but instead resorted more and more to the new mode of teaching, a mode made available through new printing technologies, that of the papal encyclical. The ever-expanding number and size of papal encyclicals in the modern world testifies that now it has become the ordinary means by which the chief shepherd leads the flock. We must note that if Catholics in the Middle Ages exaggerated the role of the council due to its frequency, some Catholics in the modern world also exaggerate the role of the council, interestingly enough, for the opposite reason, that is due to its infrequency. Some in the modern world tend to think that the presence of an ecumenical council somehow changes everything, that a council nullifies all preceding tradition. Well, this is also an exaggeration. Councils are meant to guide the faithful to a fuller understanding of what Christian truth has always been, not to change the faith into something that it is not or something new. In the following videos, then, we will delve deeper into the councils known as ecumenical, the rest of the councils known throughout history after Second Nicaea that the Church now understands as being critically important. Brothers and sisters, keep studying. This is Father Brad Elliott for the Western Dominican Province.